I'm going to talk to you about a central inner city district in London, not too far from here. It's the, uh, the Elephant and Castle, and it's, it's where I live. It's where I've lived for the last nine years. And like many inner city parts of the capital, it faces a lot of challenges. It was bombed heavily in the war. It's never been a rich area. And as this photo shows from 1970, it was substantially redeveloped in the 1960s, and in some ways quite brutally. Um, this is a photograph that was exhibited at the Venice Biennale last year. So famous is the redevelopment that happened back then. So this is a community that has, that has been resilient for a very long time. Um, if you see the context that it sits in here, you can see all the pressures coming from some really dynamic parts of London. And they suck away some of the energy from the Elephant and Castle. They suck away economy, they suck away life, and they leave us at its worst as the detritus around the edge. But I do love it there. <laughs> a few of the problems that we face, along with the deprivation, the crime, the congestion, is, is this traffic issue. This is the inner ring road carving right through the middle of the Elephant and Castle. We don't just have that. We've got all these red routes as well with all the associated buses. So that's convenient, yes, but it's noisy, it's polluting. There are educational attainment issues associated with children that grow up in these environments. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's unhealthy. This is the view from my kitchen window. There are a lot of buses that go past every day. And whilst we have a bit of greenery in the middle of the famous Elephant and Castle roundabout, the developers and the council don't categorize that as a green area at all. And if it's anything like the roundabout nearby, it could get flattened and turned into concrete in a few years' time. It, it happened uh, two years ago at the South Roundabout. So we have to be resilient here if the Elephant and Castle is going to be a pleasant, joyful, happy place to live. And it's changing. This is strata. Some people call it the lipstick. It looks a bit like that, looming over the older parts of the Elephant and Castle. And this is just the start. For decades now, the Elephant and Castle has been heralded as a place of change and rejuvenation and in reinvention. And much of that could be brilliant. And a lot more is coming. These are all towers, 20, 30, 40-story tower blocks that have got planning permission. Um, but with those, developments bring turbulence. They bring change in a community that's uncertain. They bring new people in, but they push people away. Costs rise, gentrification, the pressures on all the existing resources. How do we cope in this environment? Particularly when some of these developers, such as Oak Main here, the Oak Main Plaza, leave their sites as abandoned plots, boarded up, land, precious land and resources, potential jobs that are just taken out of circulation. Useless. This has been like that for nearly eight years. And to make matters worse, it's all carved up by the political boundaries. These white lines are the ward boundaries within Southwark. And they all meet at the Elephant and Castle. And as you can see by the colours, the politics is different. You've got liberals in one, socialists in the other, and a mixture in between. So this is my response. This is my resilience. Every green dot here marks a guerrilla garden around the Elephant and Castle, and in a few cases, further afield. I'd say about 78% of these are still thriving today. Some were planted nine years ago. We go back and maintain them. Some of them are very recent. Uh, some of them are the work of, of, of other people as well. And what I'm going to tell you about now are some of the stories behind the creation of these gardens, what they try and achieve, and the issues that we face in making them thrive. This is where I began. This is by the front door of where I live. This is Southwark Council land but Southern Council don't make a lot of investment into their public realm. <laughs> and the reason I was gardening there was because I live in this town block. It's a Southern Council building. It was originally social housing. It's, it's still majority council tenants, but there's a few of us who've moved in as private tenants, and I've, I've now become a leaseholder. 
And so I wanted to garden. That was my motivation. It was an antidote to five days a week in an office and this rather tough environment that I'd sort of accidentally chosen to live in. It was cheap, basically, cheap and convenient. I didn't expect that to be that long, but i have been drawn into it. Anyway, that, that little guerrilla gardening at 2 o'clock in the morning thrived. And I blogged about it. And I got more confident. I realized I didn't need to go out in the middle of the night. It didn't just need to be about the pleasure of gardening. <laughs> I, I could also go out at more sociable hours and discover the community. And this area, also part of my block, well, it was a blank canvas. There was a few overgrown shrubs there. This is it, actually, after we've done a lot of guerrilla gardening there. So I, I began to take that on. And people joined in. These are some kids from a few years ago who joined in planting sunflower seeds. Neighbours help out from time to time through guerrillagardening.org. I've been able to recruit people to help when there's a big job to be done. And, and it was brilliant. I even entered it into Southwark Council's Estate in Bloom competition as my front garden. I didn't win, but I felt I'll keep the certificate for when I need it, in case I get in trouble. Because, of course, this is guerrilla gardening. No permission was ever sought. Well, there have been some challenges. I had a disagreement with a bin man who said I was using his rubbish bin too much. He dumped his rubbish on, uh, on the bed. And one night I got a call from a neighbour who said, Richard, there are bicycling people all over the flower beds. <laughs> So I, I went down and challenged them, and, and they were very apologetic, and actually gave me five pounds in compensation. <laughs> and the fame of this guerrilla garden has spread. Um, this is Daryl Hannah, who splashed in to pay a visit. And the fame of this guerrilla garden is, is an inspiration to other people around the world. And, and it's one of the rewards of, 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 of being resilient with a guerrilla garden, as you get unexpected visitors. Um, the local newspaper loved this. The lifts weren't working at the time, and they, they, they made a cartoon strip about it. Um, but three years after I started there, there was an attack, um, a, a brutal, savage attack at the height of summer. You can see this buddlier here has been very crudely pruned. And this was the work of Southwark Council, who for the first time in three years decided that they would restate their claim, because my neighbours had complained that they were paying for the council to garden here, and yet the council, of course, weren't doing anything. So this was a turning point, and I got a councillor involved, and we had some meetings, and it was difficult, and they tried to portray that this guy cannot be relied upon, but I won that battle. And I said to them, if I'd asked first, would you have ever given me permission? And they said, absolutely not. But they gave permission. This is not a guerrilla garden now. It thrives. This is a photo I took last week. Uh, in 2007, when that deal was struck, they refunded three years' worth of charges, which made a lot of the residents there very happy. They got about a £120 rebate. And then a year later, this nasty little man in Southwark Council called Martin Green discovered a loophole. <laughs> An ironic name, yes. Martin Green discovered a loophole in our leases so they can charge. So ever since 2009, they've charged as if they do the gardening. And his response was, you should talk to a convincing solicitor. So this is the kind of resilience we need. It, 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 we do not have a supportive council in Southwark. Elsewhere, this is the roundabout. Transport for London didn't finish the turfing job a few years ago. <laughs> An opportunity for a guerrilla gardener. Briefly interrupted. Um, <laughs> Put down your tools or we're taking you in, they said. So we put down our tools, because this is about gardening. This is not about being arrested and protesting. I just want the gardening to be done. I'm very pragmatic. So I went home with my friends, bottle of wine, back out an hour and a half later, job done. And that was in 2008. This is how that little verge is thriving. This is a photo I took earlier in the week. It's looking good. Another roundabout, this is St. George's Circus. This is before any guerrilla gardening. This is the summer of 2005. Compacted mud, you know, wasted opportunity. It's thriving. Look at that. Thank you very much. Summer, summer 2012, the golden summer. It, it, was, it was doing beautifully. It, it is a tough location. Um, the snow... It's bad for everyone, yeah, every gardener, but what most gardeners don't get, and gardeners are a resilient bunch, I'll, I'll give them credit for that, but guerrilla gardeners are a step above. We have to deal with salt wash. 
Um, and, and this is another busy red route, and, and we've had to adapt. And Pittosporum, by the way, is good, good with salt. This is the big one. This is another bit of land. This is the division between Southwark and Lambeth. The cycle path marks it. This is before any guerrilla gardening. We went in in March 2006. By this point, with a lot of momentum behind the website, a lot of people keen to help out, and we, we pl planted lavender. And we, we've gone back many times. This is a, one of the most sociable places I garden. It, it, it's a great place. You get the cars stopping at the traffic lights, chatting, you know, the cab drivers rolling down their windows, people in the neighboring houses and college stopping and chatting. It, almost every time I go there to garden, or just to pick up a bit of litter, there's, a, there's an impromptu conversation. Sometimes the people have even given us cash. And, and this is also where I met my wife, um, planting tulips late one night six years ago. There you go. Beautiful, healthy, sustainable, good for the bees, tick, tick, tick. We have a few issues. Again, not the average beetle you get in your garden, but guerrilla gardeners have to deal with a little bit more. And we harvest it. So this is actually economically sustainable as well. We raise over a £1,000 a year by harvesting the lavender and making them into these very fragrant little pillows, which are available online. <laughs> but my love, my love with guerrilla gardening is the pavement. And the pavement is something you can do on your own, but you'll end up meeting other people doing it. It's bite-sized guerrilla gardening. And there are a lot of pavements around London that are crying out for a bit of TLC. And I, I, I encourage you to, to take part. This is um, London Road. And there are all these tree pits up there. We've, we've done all sorts of things with them. The sunflowers thriving on St. George's Road there. You know, from a few seeds sowed in April, May the 1st, is a big gorilla sunflower day. That can, can grow. And that's a, a resilient plant. You know, in one season, this is um, the, the destruction of the South Roundabout. They did plant a few trees, so we've added um, some mint there, and we've got tulips and daffodils and, and more to be done. Um, the pavement has challenges of stray pedestrians, you know, dogs, litter, so we've been experimenting with, with not shouty warning signs, that's not our style, um, but, but with gentle nudges to encourage people just not to tread on them. And the willow fedge... Is, is pretty effective. Just twigs, which inform someone that, no, this is, you know, this is protected, this is tended. But we've upgraded them recently. There are the tulips. With um, the raised bed, this was Autumn's big project. I found some wood by the roadside, left over from a construction project. Beautiful timber. We've got the raised beds in. And this is what they were looking like a few weeks ago. This is going to be glorious. Check out London Road in the summer. So the pavement... Is, is where you meet people. It's where you have the impromptu conversations. It's where you, you kind of have a big lunch uh, or big gun every time you're out there. Um, so I turned this into a campaign. <laughs> and in 2010, I launched Pimp Your Pavement because it is my passion and because it doesn't have to be a guerrilla garden. In an ideal world, the local authorities would support this. And there are local support, uh, authorities who do support this. Um, initially, Southwark took an interest. And here's a councillor and a fantastic local resident, Claire Armstrong, who helped me find a patch in Southwark that the council gave us permission to garden. This is my first ever non guerrilla garden. It was really exciting. Um, and there it is um, later that year. This is up at Trinity Street, the posher part of Southwark, um, not the Elephant and Castle, strictly speaking. And this is last autumn. Terrible. Terrible. Who would do this? Who would, who would do this? <laughs> no, this is a community garden, a, 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 an authorised community garden. This isn't a guerrilla garden. Everyone knows about this. This has been in the press and everything. Who did it? I think you know the answer. <laughs> Southwark Council, of course. The uncooperative council. So in response, they initially said, oh, we'll replant it. Look, 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 don't, don't fuss. Don't, we'll replant it. And I said, no, that is not the point. This is about us doing it. This isn't about paying people to do it. Um, I did offer to, to do it for them if they paid us, but they weren't, weren't prepared to do that. So I called a meeting with the leader of Southwark Council, Councillor Peter John and his community's cabinet member, Claire Hickson, and they came to my flat and said, look, let's talk about this. Because Lambeth Council 
have embraced Pimp Your Pavement. They've had a scheme that's won awards. It's called Fresh View. And they will help you pimp your pavement. You just contact Lambeth Fresh View, book a date in, they make it happen. It's brilliant. So I said to Peter John, I said, let's just do the same here. And, and if you haven't got the, the initiative to do it yourself, why, why don't I do it for you? You just give me a bit of funding. And you know what? I've got a little community garden project. We'll make an application through your standard schemes, and we'll just do it. And we had two meetings, and here he is, beaming away, um, in Lambeth, looking at a new Lambeth street pit that, that was happening during a fresh view scheme. And that's his cabinet member there with a handbag, and me looking a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> and, and so I made the grant application. I made the grant application. Um, I was really excited. This is going to be a turning point. And it was for £5,000, which isn't a lot in the scale of council investments. And they gave me nothing. This was two weeks ago. And I was quite upset about this. Um, and I emailed Councillor Peter John and Claire Hickson. And I said, so, you know, what's up? This was all going so well. And Peter John didn't even bother to reply. But Claire Hickson said, thing is, Richard, you see... We, we devolve decision-making about these applications to the ward councillors. So, you know, it, it's kind of up to them. But as you saw earlier, the wards are all divided up around the Elephant and Castle, and the ward councillor who decides isn't actually my ward councillor. He's the ward councillor over the road where the community garden is, and he takes no interest at all. So this is why... I turn to gardening because I have to calm down and relax. <laughs> it's so stressful. I, 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 my, my, my reaction that evening was to go out and pull up some dandelions. And I tell you, dandelions, are, they're resilient. But I can beat them. Finally, there's a lot of guerrilla gardening going on in a more hidden way, in a less public way in the Elephant and Castle. Um, this is uh, a view of the Haygate estate. Uh, which is just, just to, to the southwest corner of the roundabout. So it's a fortress. But inside, as you can see there, is actually a vast forest. We call it the Elephant and Castle Urban Forest. And, and th that's not a target. That's actually the, the view from the Shard. Um, but, 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 but it might as well be a target because, because this, is, this is coming down. This is coming down. And it's, it's become very, very controversial because it's happened very slowly. A lot of promises were made to the residents which have been broken. And as it turned out, the council sold it for, for peanuts. Um, the developers have, have done a very good deal. Now, one of the local residents, well, one of the residents of this estate um, a couple of years ago decided to start guerrilla gardening, and he contacted me for advice. But it, actually, he didn't need a lot of advice because what he was doing was brilliant, and it attracted a lot of support from other ex-residents few of the remaining residents and, and other locals, to take advantage of this vast, green, quiet, um, nature-filled space whilst it was still there. And to make a statement of resilience, to make a statement that, you know what, this is our land, this is public land, council land, and we're going to make the most of it. And the guerrilla gardens within the Haygate have thrived. Not that you would know it if you read the press. The Daily Mail and The Guardian, and only in the last two weeks, have done vast photo shoots about this estate. But they just look at the concrete, and they don't look at the trees, the 450 mature trees, and the gardens. And one of the benefits of the Gorilla Garden, other than bringing people together, having feasts, parties, was making the statement to the developer that this is a valuable natural space. And a lot of those trees have now been saved. Many will still go, but part of our campaign has, has achieved that. The estate, however, is going. And um, it, the compulsory purchase order is in. The Gorilla Gardens will finish this summer. And who knows how long it will take to, to rebuild it. And I leave you with the most audacious, albeit tiny, little bit of Gorilla Gardening I did. The first time... We did it on private, secure land, rather than neglected public space. It was about two years ago. Uh, my wife, my neighbour, Ben Mason, and I climbed over the hoardings of that development site that has stood there idle for years and years to see if we could do it, to see if we could grow something in this ruin. And 
in that mound of old Volvo dealership that was sitting there for years, we, we dug a hole and we planted a few sunflower seeds in it. And we knew we wouldn't be able to come back. It's far too inconvenient. We'd leave it for nature to, to show its resilience. And it worked. I climbed back to get the photo, but that was it. <laughs> Thank you very much.